You're listening to the Mindful Mama podcast, episode 112. Today we're talking about how to make time for mindfulness. Welcome to the Mindful Mama podcast. Here it's about becoming a less irritable, more joyful parent. At Mindful Mama, we know that you cannot give what you do not have. And when you are thriving, when you have calm and peace within, then you can give it to your children. I'm your host, Hunter Clark Fields, Mindful Mama Mentor. I coach overstressed moms on how to cultivate self-awareness in their daily lives and to take family and life to a new level of peace and cooperation. I've been practicing yoga and mindfulness for over 20 years. I'm the creator of the Mindful Parenting Course and I'm the mom of two girls who challenge me every day to hone my craft. So thank you and welcome back to the Mindful Mama podcast. I'm so glad that we're here connecting again today. If you're new, welcome. Welcome to the podcast. This episode is one of my monthly episodes with my friend Carla Nomberg. And we're going to be talking about how to make time for meditation, how to make time for mindfulness. So I know this is going to be helpful for you because you're wanting to start your meditation practice and get more peace and equanimity into your life, right? Right, right, right. Yes. I think that you're going to like what you hear today about meditation and you're going to learn about some of the benefits that are so, so powerful and important for moms, especially and parents, especially. So I hope that you will listen all the way to the end because there's um, some important resources too at the end of this podcast. Thank you so much for the iTunes reviews that have come in. We're over 100 now. Yay! So thank you to Mama Christian, to T Park 44, and to KCCC2 for the wonderful five star iTunes reviews. I'm so, so appreciative. Thank you so much. KCCC2 says that. It was her new favorite podcast, and T Park 44 mentions my conversation with Dr. John Duffy as a must-hear for all parents of teens and soon-to-be teens. So that's episode 105. You can go and listen to that. You're welcome. Thank you, T Park 44, and thank you so much to Mama Christian. She wrote Hope with five stars for the review. So thank you so very much for those wonderful, wonderful reviews. That helps out a lot. Thank you. And then finally, just before we dive into this episode of my conversation with Carla, I want to let you know that we just have a few spots left for my in-person spring retreat. So if you want to come hang out with me, spend a day together, enjoy deep relaxation, mindful, conscious discussion, a great speaker, good food, a beautiful place. Come and hang out with me in Wilmington, Delaware on April 14th. And you can find out more about that at mindfulmamamentor.com slash spring retreat or on the events page on my site, but that's mindfulmamamentor.com slash spring retreat. There's less than six spots left. So if you're interested, get your ticket now and then we'll get to hang out in person. And now, on to this episode. Thanks, as always, for coming on the Mindful Mama podcast, Carla. I am so happy to be here, Hunter. Who the heck are you? (laughs) (laughs) Oh, you want me to introduce myself? Got it. Oh, thank you. My name is Carla Nomberg, and I'm a clinical social worker and parent coach. I work with parents all over the country. And I'm the author of two, soon to be three books on mindfulness and parenting. My forthcoming book that I'm writing right now is called How to Stop Losing Your Beep with Your Kids, except I use the actual word in the title, but I'm trying not to make Hunter Beep for podcast. This is my ongoing goal every time I'm on here. So I'm writing this book about how parents can stay calm and not lose our temper with our kids. It's going to be super fun with lots of swear words. And I'm also the mother of two daughters who are seven and a half and nine. Carla, my daughters changed ages, meaning they have their birthdays. And my daughters are now 11 and 8. It's crazy. Oh, oh my gosh. That 11-year-old is a tween. She, she's yeah, officially she's, like a tween. She's really, really a tween, too. She's definitely oh. a tween. <laughs> is that going okay? Are you all right? Have you started drinking heavily? What's happening? <laughs> well, there might be more chocolate being consumed in the house by me. That's for sure. Yeah. But, um, a lot of but, chocolate. 
Yeah, yeah. it's I'm, I'm having to up my game again. I'm back to reaffirming and restudying and things like this. I have new books to look at. Like what's this new one I have? Hold on. Fourteen Ways to Hide in the Closet. That one. That's a great one. Ah! Oh, my book. So a new book I'm going to check out soon is from, is called Don't Let Your Emotions Run Your Life for Teens. And it's by... So is, is that a book you're going to try to get her to read? <laughs> yes. But I'm because if I offered first... that to my daughter, I know, I'm sure yeah. she'd like throw it in my face and I'd get a head injury. <laughs> I hope it's not a heavy, thick book. I hope it's like a thin volume that's unlikely to inflict bodily damage. It's like it's like a workbook. So I don't know. We're going to see how it goes. I'm hoping maybe if I offer it to her before she's a teen, she'll be so like, I think it's cool that I offered her a book for teens that she'll maybe check it out. Yeah. Let us know how that goes. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> this is the difference between me and you. You're like, I am up in my game. I'm affirming myself. I've gotten this awesome book. And I'm like, why don't you just start drinking and lock yourself in the closet? Which I feel like that was a good time for me to say I don't actually drink. And so every time I make these drinking jokes, I feel like really ambivalent about them because they're funny. But to all you moms out there who don't drink, I don't drink either. So that's a conversation for a different time. Yeah, but I'm still yeah. going to make the jokes because I, I'm inconsistent. <laughs> well, today we're going to talk about how to fit meditation in. And this is specifically for parents, not for people who have you know, say two hours a day extra to meditate or whatever, because their lives are busy, aren't that busy. This is actually for busy parents who yes. want to meditate. And why would we want to meditate? I'm sure you can add on to this, but if you're a new listener to the podcast, you may might want to hear this. But if you're an, a veteran, a friend, an old compadre, we'll just share this with you again, that meditation has been research proven to help us to lower our stress response and to help us in so many ways with our sleep. It can help with anxiety and depression. And really as parents, what's very, very important about meditation in particular is that it helps us to slow down our reactivity, bringing us mm. out of that fight, flight, or street freeze stress response, that reactivity like, oh my God, my child's a threat to me and I have to respond instantaneously to this threat and into a place where we can actually be more thoughtful in the way we respond to our kids and less cro <laughs> So do uh, you have anything to add to the why we want to meditate part, Carl? Yeah. I mean, the way I talk about it is that when I'm not meditating, it's like I am this big red glowing button and my daughters can push it just by looking at me and they push my buttons and I bite their heads off and I snap and I lose it. And the more that I practice meditation and mindfulness, it's like the button gets smaller and less sensitive and a little harder to find. And maybe they have to push it three or four times before I lose it instead of just once. And on the couple times that I've been on like a four or five day silent retreat, I come home and I'm like the freaking dolly mama. Like anything they do, I'm like, that's cool. Okay, I can handle this. You're throwing pudding at the wall. That's okay, honey. We'll take care of it. I'm fine. And my husband's like looking at me and it's amazing. And then of course, like, you know, 24 hours later, it's gone and I'm a psychopath again. But I, I really see a direct link between how often I am meditating and practicing mindfulness. And I'm using those two words intentionally. So we can talk about mm -hmm. that in a minute. Mm -hmm. And how much sort of more calm and chill and less reactive and crazy I am. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Sure. Big time. And uh, yeah, I mean, so what Carla's saying is basically it's like, it brings us some equanimity and I love Ooh. that word because it's just like, kind of smooths out the bumps, you know, like the lows are a little lower, the reactions are a little softer. We can kind of chill just a little bit more. We can bring it out that inner peaceful chill mama just a little bit more a little bit yeah more. so we're, and it's it's really kind of like the parental superpower and why i talk about this um we just had our latest round of mindful parenting and role and we what we talked about with this with that is that that you know like you may want to learn some communication skills so that your kids are less resistant to what you say you may want to you know like there's all this stuff out there with like really great advice like how ways to speak to our kids so that we're not pushing their buttons so much and not having so much conflict and all of that but 
unless we can access that advice, like, and we can be less reactive and train ourselves to be less reactive, the advice is as good as useless because we can't access it. You know, so we need this other whole other part of the equation, Mm -hmm. which is slowing down our stress response and that work with ourselves to calm down, to slow down, to, to be present and actually listening and understanding how things are affecting us in our relationship with our kids. Absolutely. So that is why we want to meditate. Carla, do you want to talk about the difference between mindfulness and meditation? And we kind of can, we can sometimes use them synonymously, but there's some differences. Do you want to share that what that is? Yeah, I'd love to. So I think of mindfulness really as a state of mind, right? An awareness, a presence, a way of being in the world. And so if you, dear listeners, feel like you're going a little bonkers because you hear about like mindful house cleaning and mindful hugging and mm-hmm. mindful shopping and mindful everything and you're like are you freaking kidding me with this well it's because it's just a shorthand for saying anything we can do we can do mindfully which means we're paying attention to what we're doing we're interested in what we're doing we're sort of curious and compassionate about whatever's going on rather than you know standing over this pot of noodles and being like i freaking can't stand my kids and i hate dinner time and why am i making noodles for the 87th time this week you know it's like okay here i am i'm just making noodles Am I feeling frustrated? Why am I feeling frustrated? It's okay to feel frustrating when your kids won't eat anything but noodles. And so there, there's a subtle difference there, but that difference, that ability to be present for what we're doing. So we're doing like one thing at a time with our mind and body, and we're interested in our experience. It really does lower your stress, make you less reactive. It's like instead of having you know 20 tabs open on your computer browser, and then all of a sudden the computer freezes up and you don't know what to do, You've got one tab open and you're actually reading what's on that tab. So that's how I think about it. So that's mindfulness. Now, this is a skill. It's it's something we can get better at doing it. And research has actually found that some people are sort of more inherently mindful than other people, which is not surprising. You know, there's always going to be differences in what we're good at. But the good news for all of us is that we can all get better at it. And the way we get better at it is by practicing. So meditation is the formal practice of mindfulness where we are actually sitting down and or standing or walking or lying down. I mean, there's a lot of ways to do it, but we are making a choice that in this moment, I am setting aside time just for me with the explicit intention of practicing mindfulness. And the way I think about it is if, you know, sort of throughout the day, we're just sort of kind of trying to mindfully be aware of whatever we're doing. That's kind of akin to saying, I want to get in better shape. So I'm going to walk over across the parking lot to get to the mall, or I'm going to take the stairs instead of taking the elevator or whatever. And meditation is like going to the gym. It's like, I really you know, want to do this. I'm going to go to the gym and actually exercise these mind muscles. And I, I know we don't have muscles in our mind, but you know what I'm saying? Just because I feel like you're going to get emails like, Carla, there's no muscle. I know, no (laughs) muscles in the mind. And what we know about meditation is that the impact is what we call dose dependent, which means that the more you meditate, the more you're going to experience the positive benefits of meditation. And then what I find is, you know, if you go to the gym and you're in good shape, then when in the middle of the day, you know, all of a sudden you've got to grab your toddler from running into the street while you're holding 14 grocery bags you're going to have the physical ability to do that at the spur of the moment because you're flexible and you're in good shape. And the same is true with mindfulness. If you've been practicing, perhaps by meditating every day, then when you are all of a sudden in a stressful moment where there's 14 things going on and you need to make a quick decision and your kid is nagging you, you will be more likely to be calm and intentional in that moment because you've been practicing all along. So for me, that's where I see the real benefits of meditation is that I'm I'm much more likely to be calm and compassionate and the kind of parent I want to be. And it comes easier in the course of a busy day when I have been meditating. Does that make sense? That's a beautiful, beautiful explanation. And I, I think that I want to add to that. I love that you mentioned that it's dose dependent. And I want to add that, you know, sometimes when we talk about some of these like benefits, like equanimity or, you know, we're less reactive and things like that. This doesn't mean like we have sparkles shooting out of our ears and we have no problems I anymore. I, you totally have, do. I, I do. know I've seen those sparkles anyway, <laughs> but I mean, because the thing is like, but I want to mention this other benefit is that when things do happen, like 
when my preteen, my tween says something that hurts my feelings and makes me sad and I cry, I cry and then I recover a little more quickly. You know, I, right. and that's a really important benefit, I think, as parents is that when, say, we lose it or say we have something happens and our equilibrium is upset, a steady practice of mindfulness and meditation can help you get back to your equilibrium more quickly. I mean, I think it's pretty much because you're practicing it. What you practice grows. And so your brain is more used to this calmer, peaceful state. And so it's easier to get back to it. And it's really important that why we're talking about fitting it into your daily life, because it really is important that you practice it. You can't just go out, you know, and expect to be calm and not so reactive when your world is falling apart and everybody's screaming and there's pudding on the wall. <laughs> if, you haven't, if you haven't been practicing it, it is like the gym metaphor is great because it really is like a muscle that you build and literally in the brain, there are networks, you know, and it's much easier for you to create those connections when you've been practicing. It's literally in the brain like a, a deeper groove, a more well-worn path in the brain that it's easier for your neurons to connect in that way. So quite literally, it, it becomes much easier with practice. And the example I give in my talks is we would never send our child out into the championship soccer game and say you need to score the game winning goal if we hadn't been sending them to practice all season right like we wouldn't do that that would be awful it would be mean and they'd probably fail because they hadn't been practicing and yet what i did for years and what i see many parents do still is we read about mindful parenting and we decide we're going to be calmer and we decide we're not going to scream at our kids anymore and then as long as things are going well we do nothing we don't we don't change anything because why would you if things are going well? But then all of a sudden, you know, you're in the middle of the dairy aisle at the grocery store and the kid is having a fit. I cleaned up my language there. The kid is having a fit and screaming. And for us parents, that's kind of like, you know, the championship soccer game, game winning goal. The pressure is on. How are you going to respond? And so then we haven't been practicing all along and we expect ourselves to be perfect, but we don't know what to do. So we fall into these old habits. We get cranky and snap at them. And then even worse, we beat ourselves up for not doing better. And what I really want to say to parents is if you're trying to stay calm or more present or more patient with your kids, it's not a matter of willpower. And I think when we set ourselves up for thinking it's willpower, that's, that's kind of doing ourselves a major disservice. It's a matter of practice and really compassion for giving ourselves for when we get it wrong because kids can really show up with some doozies and this parenting thing isn't easy. So when we can practice the skills we want, you know, practice when it's easy so that when it's hard, we'll already have those skills down. And then when we screw it up anyways, which we all will, and it's okay to be compassionate for yourself, to yourself. Yeah. Yes, yeah. exactly. So now everyone wants to meditate, right? You want to meditate? Oh, of course. <laughs> I want to meditate. You know, it's funny because before I started my meditation practice, I read about meditation for about a decade. And then I've... <laughs> Me too. Doesn't about. everyone... <laughs> We all read it. I love doing it. Oh, listener, you don't have to read about it for a decade or listen to me and Carla talk about it for a decade. You no, they do start. have to listen to us for a decade, but they can meditate right now. <laughs> they can meditate right now. They can yeah. do both. Our listeners are talented. They can you do can both. do both. I mean, really, and even beyond parenting, meditation just helps you be more present for your life. And I mean, my gosh, like we get this life. We get this one life and we don't want to spend the whole thing like lost in anxiety and completely distracted and staring at a little box in our hands, you know, like we want to be able to be present for this life. And it's hard to be present for this life because life is intense and challenging and, you know, just a lot, a lot to take in. And, and meditation can really help you to just be present for your life and to be present for all those, you know, because when we numb the, when we numb the bad things, right. When maybe by our, our shopping or our having a, having a drink or our cookies or whatever we're doing or a distraction with our phone, we're numbing all the good stuff too. Like we miss all these good moments too. So just another plug for being, being present for life. Yes. Well, I think it, it, it's the big stuff, right. That's really hard to be present for, but it's also the small stuff. And a yeah. perfect example of this is 
literally 10 minutes ago, right before we got on the phone, I went ahead and made myself a cup of coffee and forgot to put the mug under the coffee maker. So I come over and there's a huge puddle of coffee all over my counter, which is like sad on so many levels. But that made my life a little bit harder. And I say a little bit, it's a little bit harder. But all of a sudden, I've got this huge spill to clean up and I've got to make another cup of coffee. And then I spend a few minutes thinking I'm an idiot because how many times am I going to do this? And just that one thing, eh, not such a big deal. But when we have some version of that 10 times in a day where you can't find your keys and you leave your wallet on top of the car at the gas station and you forget to turn off the stove and you spill the coffee. And I mean, one time when my daughter was a baby, I drove her all the way to daycare and got there before I realized I hadn't buckled her into her car seat. Oh like gosh. I put her in and I forgot to buckle her. I was horrified and terrified. I think I'm, I don't know. I'm clearly still processing this one, even though it was almost a decade ago. And so if we're lucky, these little gaps won't turn into something bigger. But even if they don't, every time we lose, forget, break, drop, whatever, the things in our lives, it makes our day feel a little bit harder. And good golly, life is hard enough. I just said, good golly. Okay. Anyway, <laughs> life is hard enough. I know, right? When I'm, oh. The point is like life, busy life with kids is hard enough. Let's not make it any harder. And when I am more mindful, which I'm more likely to be when I'm meditating, life feels just a little bit easier. And that's not nothing. Yes. It makes a huge, huge difference in life. For me, personally, it made the difference between having a, a practice of 10 minutes of meditation about two or three months after I had practiced this, I realized that before I had done this, I started when I was 27 years old. And when before 27 years of my life, I had would fall into like a pit of depression kind of every week or every two weeks. And I would cry and I felt like I couldn't handle life. I mean, I really, you know, whatever, I'm on some spectrum of something. But after doing meditation for a couple months, I thought, oh, nothing is working. This is not even like, I'm just sitting here thinking the whole time. But I, I hadn't had any of those pits of depression at all. And I don't get them anymore. So, I mean, it can, depending on where you are, that percentage difference in your life can be really huge. Hunter, I am, yes. I'm going to ask you a question that I know is on everybody's mind because you just said 10 minutes a day and every <laughs> single, you know what question's coming because you get it every time you give a talk and I get it every time I give a talk. How long do we have to meditate for, Hunter? I mean, seriously, give me the magic number that's going to fix all my problems while not taking up my entire day. Go ahead, starting now. <laughs> all right. So as you know, of course, Carla, there's no, there's no magic number. And it's kind of like <laughs> exercise, right? Like it's dose dependent. So the more you do, the better you feel in a lot of ways. But it doesn't mean you have to go be an ultra marathoner to feel fit and good and healthy in your body and to have a better experience of life, right? And so it's the same with meditation. And for me, starting out 10 minutes a day felt okay. That felt like a good way to start out. But I actually have, you know, on my website, I have a meditation that's for free. That's three minutes. And I really think that when we're talking about meditation, we want to be talking about how can you build a consistent practice? Mm, yes. Consistency is more important than the amount of time. And so mm -hmm. it doesn't matter necessarily what your meditation looks like to start with. And in fact, it's much easier if you can make it as painless and pleasant as possible in the beginning. What you really want to be doing for the first month, two months, six months is to just make it so that you're building a habit of making this thing a part of your life. So making it three minutes a day, five minutes a day, if that feels good, sure, try out 10 minutes a day. But you know what? One minute a day counts. And if you're being very intentional and saying, I'm going to sit down and make this consistently do this one minute a day, every day after I brush my teeth, I just sit on the toilet lid and I set a timer for <laughs> a minute. That's a great practice. That's a really wonderful way to start a practice. That's right. And I love that you use the teeth brushing example because the goal, so for me, here's the deal. Every time I get out of the shower, I have to brush my teeth. It's just become such a habit that if I take two showers in a day, it doesn't matter. I just have to brush my teeth after I get out of the shower. And what I'm trying to get to, and to be all honest with our listeners, I'm not there yet, but I want to get to the point where I have that sort of relationship with meditation that I get up in the morning and I meditate or whenever it is, that it's just a thing that it's like, nope, I just do it. 
And I'm not there yet. It's a practice for me. But that I think is the ideal thing that we have some sort of trigger that it's like you get up in the morning or you drop your kids off at school or whatever it is. And then you just meditate. Now, I think this is particularly hard. This is a long term goal for me. And it may not be till my kids are at college because my schedule varies so much from day to day, depending on whether or not my kids are in school. Hello, snow days. We're Mm. like knee deep in snow day territory. You know, my kids are unpredictable about where they when they wake up. It depends so much day to day. My schedule varies. And so I am not at a point yet where I have that sort of perfect, really super consistent time for my meditation. And so I just want to offer that to parents, that it's a goal to work towards. But if you find it's really hard to do it the exact same time every day in the exact same way, that's okay. Like be flexible and be understanding. And I actually want to share, Hunter, if I can really quick, Mm -hmm. three very brief stories that happened to me early on in my meditation practice that were such a gift to me. The first is I was listening to a podcast with a well-known meditation teacher and the interviewer asked the guest, to tell me about your meditation practice. And the teacher said, in all honesty, I haven't meditated in two weeks. I fell off the wagon and I'm not back on yet. Wow. And to hear this person who was such a big name in the mindfulness community say that in this public space in a really honest and authentic and compassionate way was such a gift to me. I just, I wanted to hug him. I was like, thank you. Thank you. I needed to hear that from somebody that I thought was perfect. None of us are perfect. We're all struggling. So that's the first one that happened to me. The second one was I remember a time being on retreat with a different well-known mindfulness teacher. And this teacher sent us all out to go off and do our mindful walking. So I'm like doing my little zombie mindful walking. Not that I, my brain was a zombie, <laughs> but you, you kind of look like a zombie when you're doing mindful walking. Yeah. And I turn this corner and there's the meditation teacher sitting on a bench checking their phone. <laughs> and to me, again, total gift. I was not like, what are you doing? I was like, thank you. You're a human being. And when you're in the middle of a busy day teaching a whole retreat, instead of meditating, you're checking your phone. Like that was actually, I admired the person and I was grateful for it. Like, right, we're not perfect. And then the third piece was just, you know, I took a year long seminar on meditation and psychotherapy when my kids were toddlers. And part of the requirement for the seminar was that we'd be meditating for 40 minutes a day. And I was like, yeah, I can totally do that. And then within a week, I was like, yeah, I'm totally not doing that. So a couple of weeks in, I went to my instructor and I said, I have to be really honest with you. I'm not meditating for 40 minutes a day. It's just not happening. And he looked at me and he said, you have young children in the house. Your children are your practice. Hmm. And Again, such a gift of compassion and understanding when you are a parent with children in the house, especially if they're young children, and especially if you are a full-time parenting in the home and not working outside the home, it's going to be especially challenging for you and let it be okay. Like that's the place where we really want to come in with some compassion. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And let's get down to some, I love those stories, Carla, because- let's focus. Okay. Oh, no, no. I love those stories. I think that those are really helpful. I love that for me, even too, those are great to hear. And they're new ones. I love that. So, so if you want to have a practice and you have, you maybe have an unpredictable schedule and like Carla said, we're working towards maybe an ideal of when you can kind of fit it into your life. There's some ways <laughs> you can fit meditation into your life that can be kind of sneaky, right? So yeah. you can... I think it is kind of ideal to do it first thing in the morning before anyone else wakes up. That's really kind of a nice thing to do if you can do that. I mean, I'm so serious about this in my life because I know it makes such a huge difference in my life that I have a like kind of a freakishly long bedroom. It's like sort of, I don't know, 15 feet long. (laughs) And I put my, my alarm clock is plugged in on the opposite side of my bedroom from where I sleep. So I, have this guilt of waking up my husband so that it starts to ding and I have to like get up out of bed and walk all the way across <coughs> the room to be able to get my phone. I don't wake up easily. So there are things you can do. That's not one of sort of the sneaky things, but to wake up early is really nice, but you can also fit in a three minute meditation maybe after you drop your kid at preschool, like say you have a a preschooler, you have three hours a day, you can sit in the car and do three minutes of meditation. You can 
you can go in the bathroom for three minutes and sit there on the toilet lid for three minutes and just sit there and breathe there. You can also practice when you're going for a walk. I have a client who was walked home from her daughter's preschool and I invited her to, and she not to take her phone and she's still not taking her phone and she just walks and is present uh, doing a walking meditation on her way home from school. And another thing she does, which I think is like amazing of her. And I'm so like in awe is that she is basically doing a playground meditation where she is, doesn't take her phone out. She sits on the playground and she chills and she watches her kid and does watches her breath and does a playground meditation, which I think is brilliant. Right. Love like it. love that. Love it. And I was thinking of some other ones too. And the one thing I want to say is you know, if your kid is on the playground for an hour, you and you don't want to meditate the whole time or you feel like you get two ants in your pants, fine. Do it for 10 minutes and then pull out your phone or then yeah. talk to your friend or whatever it is. So it doesn't have to be all or nothing. Um, yeah, yeah, that's, a, that's the women, same thing for, yeah. I'm just jumping there for breastfeeding, right? Because if you have a baby. Ah, uh, you stole it. I was going to say that. Uh, Nursing yeah. is a great time. Nursing yeah. is a really great time, but your baby might nurse for a while and it could be you know, right. like, like it's okay. Right. Like I found it boring. Like it's not always all like a gazing and gorgeous, but maybe you can take set a timer for five or 10 minutes and just make those 10 minutes this time where you're, you're practicing to be present and noticing and expecting your mind to wander and then coming back. But it doesn't have to be the whole time. Right. So Sorry, some I other times you. I was thinking, no, this is a great <laughs> list. I try to do it when I'm in the shower. And so, you know, either focusing on my breath or focusing on what I'm doing and really make this set this intention at the beginning of my shower. I'm going to focus on what I'm doing. And if my mind wanders, I'm going to bring it back to what I'm doing. Because, you know, what I really want to do in the shower, not want to do, what I end up doing in the shower often is, did I remember to schedule the dentist appointment? You know, what's the list of things I want to do today? Which clients do I have? What's coming up? What's on, you know? And then I get to the end of the shower, my hair is wet and I have no idea if I even washed it. And so instead, I try to really focus on what's going on in the shower and pay attention when my mind wanders, bring it back, bring it back. I do it. I'll try to get to pick up in the afternoons before school. I'm sorry, after school, a little bit early, sit in the car for a few minutes, uh, side of the soccer field. I'll end up doing it because my kids are a little bit older, so we're in soccer land now. Sometimes, you know, when I put the girls in front of the TV for like 20 minutes, they, you know, my inclination is, okay, I have to rush through these 20 minutes and get the dishwasher unloaded and dinner started, blah, 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 blah. And often I'll say, no, I'm going to give myself like five minutes to just sit here and breathe. Um, another one is sometimes my kids will ask me to stay in their room a little bit at night when they're trying to fall asleep. And in the past, I would bring my phone in and I'd turn the screen down really dark and open up my Kindle app on the black screen with the white letters so I could read while I was sitting there waiting for them to fall asleep. And there was hardly any light coming off my phone. And now I actually try not to bring my phone in and I'll lay there and meditate. The downside of that is sometimes I fall asleep in my room and then I wake up with a crick in my neck. That's okay. So I think there's a lot of ways you can sneak it in. I mean, just yesterday I had to take the car into the shop. And so I'm sitting there waiting and I'm pecking away on my computer trying to get work done. And I look over and the woman next to me is sitting there with her eyes closed and she was sitting up straight and I'm pretty sure she was meditating. And I was like, Whoa. don't, I could have been doing this. And like, good reminder. And the thing I want to say is if you feel uncertain about or uncomfortable meditating in public with your eyes closed, you don't have to close your eyes. Like that's totally not a requirement. And in fact, some meditation teachers say that you should always meditate with your eyes open. And so I think that when you're at home, you can choose what you're most comfortable with, but certainly when you're out in public, you should do what you feel most comfortable with and meditating with your eyes open is totally legit. It's fine. The other thing I would say is like, I want to take a minute and talk about what you're doing with your body when you meditate, because if you go online, you know, how to do a sitting meditation, there are lots of great articles that talk about posture and certainly different schools of meditation have different suggestions for what to do. And I definitely come from the school of pragmatism, i.e. like what works and also kind of trying to do what my body needs. So there are times when I do sit on my cushions next to my bed. I have like my little setup there and I will kind of sit in a way that I've been taught more formally. And then there are times when I'm like, wow, I'm having a really hard day and I need to feel uber supported and comfortable and happy. And I will go lay down on my couch with a blanket. And any serious meditation teacher might be like, dude, what are you like? Not cool. What are you doing? You look like you're taking a nap. 
but I'm actually meditating. Um, just be careful because if it's right before pickup and you fall asleep and you almost miss your kid's pickup, that's a problem. I've only done that twice, I think. Um, so, and then sometimes if I notice that my body is super antsy and I am having a hard time sitting still, I try to respect that. And I will get up and stretch a little bit and then sit back down or I'll go out for a walk and do a walking meditation. So there are a lot of different ways to do this. And I would say, you know, if you're the kind of person that really benefits and thinks it'll be easier for you, if you have specific kind of rules about what to do, that's fine. But if you're the kind of person that's like, I just need to kind of try to calm my mind and focus, then see if you can notice what your body needs and respect that a little bit. Now, Hunter, I know what I said is kind of a little bit controversial in the mindfulness circles. So I'm wondering what you think about that. What the like, don't, you don't have to sit up straight thing. Yeah, that like it's okay to lie on your couch and meditate. Oh, no, actually, I'm totally with you. I'm good with that. Okay. Actually, there's a really great TED Talk about meditation that I really recommend everybody check out, which is called Debunking the Five Most Common Meditation Myths by Light Watkins. And he's this great teacher. And one of the things he suggests is like, chill out like in your lazy boy. <laughs> Like, relax back, like, make meditation as com- you want to be as comfortable as you would feel, like, when you're chilling out watching TV, right? So let's, let's make it really comfortable. And I think, I agree. I think that, I think that seems really good. I find I need to sit up. I'm, I'm a, I have a long torso and I have to kind of protect my back. So posture is kind of a thing for me personally, but I feel very right. comfortable sitting up pretty straight, you know, and, and all of that. So, and, and just putting myself in that position can be grounding and can, can kind of evoke an intention for people. So, you know, there's also that, but it's totally legit to relax on your lazy boy or to lie down and meditate. I have a friend who does a guided meditation when she wakes up in the morning in her bed, because she knows when she gets out of bed, she's not going to like her life is going to get the bit full and she's not going to do it. So that's smart, really skillful, very practical way to, to do that. Yeah. So I think that really fitting it in where you can is really important in a way that works for you. And, you know, people often ask me, do you meditate with your children? Mm. And the short answer is no, not really. I will try to be as mindful as I can around them. And be really present and do one thing at a time when I'm with them. Cause I find that if I'm doing more than one thing at a time, when I'm with them, I get very stressed out and more likely to snap at them. And there are times when they've asked me to meditate with them and we have done that, but I have to get myself in the headspace of this is an activity I am sharing with my children. This is not my meditation time, even though I think it's still beneficial. And like, I just need to sit here and be chill and be present because yeah. my kids get, incredibly squirmy. They lay down, they stand up, they ask, are we done yet? Then 20 seconds later, are we done yet? Even though they can see the little timer right in front of us and they just get like super twitchy. And so if I feel like this is my meditation time and they're being all twitchy and squirmy, then I am more likely to get kind of tense and frustrated. Like, no, no, behave. This is mommy's time. And that kind of defeats the purpose. Yes. I'm getting even more tense. So like it doesn't happen that often. It's not like my kids are begging me to meditate every day, but on the rare occasion that it does, I just recognize, okay, this is just another activity with them. But I, you know, I've heard people talk about like, yeah, I just meditate and the kids come and sit on my lap and I keep meditating. And I'm like, wow, that's amazing because I I can't do that. So I think figuring out what works for you, but generally speaking, I, I don't meditate with my kids. What about you, Hunter? No, I don't, but they see it. So there, one thing that's helpful for fitting your meditation in is to make it easy and to make it accessible. Like, so if you, it's, it helps you to remember to, that you want to practice, to have a little space set up. I think that's really nice. So why I mentioned this is because the way I meditate is that at the end of my freakishly long room. I have a little, I have a trunk with a Buddha on it and I have my cushion right there to the side and we have some flowers and things. And so it's like a little space that's dedicated. It's some breathing room. It's a space that's dedicated for meditation. And I think it's nice to have space in your house like that. It's nice to have space dedicated because it, it's a mark and a sign to your children and your family that this it's important to you that slowing down, 
and taking care of ourselves and taking care of our minds as well as our bodies is important. And then, so when I meditate in the morning, sometimes they wake up when I'm meditating and they come in and well, they're 11 and eight now, or oh my God, yeah, eight. And so <laughs> it's different than it was when they were little, but when they were littler, like my daughter might come and curl up on my lap and yeah, do she would just kind of be sleepy and just chill there while I meditated. And it was really beautiful. And sometimes my cat comes and sits in my lap and I'm super psyched about that to have kitty meditation. Yeah, that's cool in the cat. <laughs> yeah, and no, I it's think- not anything formal for them. It's just something that they see that are, their parents do. And it's just about, for me, walking the talk, you know? And I, I love the point you make about sort of creating that space because right now my meditation cushions are really gently nestled in between the chair where I pile my half dirty but could still be worn laundry and the laundry basket full of really dirty laundry. And (laughs) like I look at it and I'm I'm less inclined to go there because it's not like, oh great, I'm gonna go sit with my laundry. Like that doesn't feel (laughs) nourishing or lovely or sweet. It just reminds me of how much like the endless laundry I have to do. And so you're actually kind of inspiring me to think more about can I find a little corner in my house that I could make more inviting and kind of more respectful of this practice that's so important to me. So I appreciate you bringing that up. I think I also love what you said about kind of doing whatever we can to make it easier to meditate. And so I have a couple thoughts on that, if I may share them. One is continuing to get support with this practice. Mm. And so whether that's, you know, my synagogue has a weekly meditation group, which I can't make because it's right when I have to drop off my kids at school, but I love that they offer it. And so when you can find things like that, either through your church or your synagogue or local meditation center, or, you know, just if you can find a group, you can join once a week or even once a month. Because one of the great things about meditating with a group of people is it's wicked embarrassing to get up in the middle and walk out of the room. So, so there's like <laughs> peer pressure. You have to sit there. And that's actually really good. Reading books about mindfulness and meditation, listening to podcasts like Hunters, just whatever you can do to continue to kind of nourish and feed this practice and have it sort of salient in your mind is really, really helpful because it's hard to do it all alone. So when you have sort of that ongoing support, whether it's another friend you can meditate with, or I I heard Sylvia Bornstein, who's an amazing meditation teacher, say once that she's also a psychologist. And when she's working with her clients, she'll say, you know what? I meditate every morning at 7 a.m. So if you get up at 7 a.m., you can know that we're kind of meditating together. And even though they're in their separate houses, I loved that idea. And she was saying, and you could even shoot me an email afterwards and just let me know you meditated or I'll do the same thing. And so I thought that was such a skillful and beautiful way to sort of have that connection, even when they couldn't physically be together. So that's one thing. And then the other thing that I often get asked about, and I have very mixed feelings about is using apps for meditation. And on the one hand, there are some apps, and I'm happy to share my favorite one, which is Insight Timer. And we can talk about that in a minute. There are definitely apps that can be more useful. And I've seen you know, a lot of meditation teachers out there who do use the apps. For me, getting space from my phone is an ongoing challenge. And certainly not wanting to introduce more screen time to my kids is a goal of mine. And so I'm not super familiar with the meditation app for apps for kids. And I know there are some, but I don't, I don't want to introduce more opportunities for my kids to stare at a screen. We got enough of those. Thank you. But having said that, a mindfulness app is probably better than a lot of other things they could be staring at. So if you really need your kid to have some screen time and they're willing to look at like Headspace, which has some cute little animations for kids, or there's some other good apps I've heard of. Go Zen. I have friends who love Go Zen. So, you know, it's a balance because there is good content. And, but just speaking for myself, I know that I'm constantly working to put down my phone, especially when I'm with my kids. And so anything that's going to have me staring at my phone more, I'm trying to be pretty skeptical about. I do like Insight Timer because, so I've talked to meditation teachers who don't use timers at all. And they sort of intermittently look at their watch that doesn't work for me because I need to be able to really settle and know that the timer is just going to go off. So the reasons I like Insight Timer are one, it's free. Two, they have these fun little sort of digital singing bowls. So you can pick like which sound you like to start and end your meditation. And when you open the app, it shows a map of the world and all these little dots of all these people who are currently meditating. And I just, I have a sweet little moment when I'm like, oh, I'm here. I'm with my peeps because as common as mindfulness and meditation are becoming, every once in a while, I still get that look like, oh, you're one of those people who meditates. Like, you don't have your 
blank together. And so I, I, I love feeling, see, I didn't swear, Hunter. I want well, like so many points. Thank you. So I do love that when you open Inside Timer, I feel connected to all these people around the world who are meditating. And there are a ton of guided meditations. So you can either just set a timer and have your silent meditating time, or there are a ton of guided meditations by a variety of people, different lengths. So you can really pick the ones you want. So I do like Insight Timer. I think ultimately, you know, I may get to the point where I just buy myself like a little refrigerator cooking magnet thing and have it next to my spot and just use that because I am trying to get away from my phone. So I don't know. What do you think about apps, Hunter? I'd love your opinion. Actually, I use Insight Timer too. So I'm going to have to find you, Carla. I'm going to look you up. Carla, you know, you can, because because you can look up your friends on Insight Timer. Oh, right. We could connect there. Yeah. And see how how and then, poorly I'm meditating. <laughs> no, but I see my friend Sarah. Like every day we meditate at the same time. It's really cool. But um, oh, I love yeah, that. you guys can look me up. Just look up Hunter in Wilmington, Delaware, and you might find me and you might notice we're meditating together, which is cool on Insight Timer app. So I, I do use that. And I I like it. And actually I like it for, that's the one, one of the ways I share meditation with my daughter is as a guide, it, guide her to sleep meditation. Cause my eight year old sometimes has trouble falling asleep and insight timer has great kids meditations guiding them to sleep. But I hear you about that. And I my actually my daughter, my 11 year old recently said, well, if I can't have electronics in your, my room, how come you have your phone plugged into your room? basically, because I use it as an alarm clock, you know, so but she totally called me out on it. So now I have ordered an alarm clock. And so my phone will have to be plugged in downstairs. So I might be going kitchen timer with you. I don't know. Yeah. So I think I would just encourage, again, what we're going for is making meditation as easy and doable as possible, but also making it as consistent as possible. So if you find that using an app, I mean, I just had a conversation the other night with a guy who's been using the Headspace app. It's a great one. It's not free but it's a great app and he's been using it for three years. And he's like, I pay for it because I meditate every single day with this app. So clearly that works for him. So I think it's just a matter of sort of experimenting and bringing kind of this curious attitude, like what's working. And if it works for you, great. And if you find that you open your phone, you know, you sit down and pull out your phone to start meditating and instead you're scrolling through Facebook, like maybe not the greatest option. So just try things out and see what works for you. Yeah. Yeah. This is, this is great. So I hope that we are giving you dear listener as some ideas about here, like why you want to meditate, you know, how this can, it can really be life-changing as, as far as more equanimity, more, less reactiveness and things like that. And we've been talking about ways to fit the formal practice of mindfulness in, we talked to them about the reasons why, like it's important to practice ahead of time. And a lot of people talk about that. We could talk, there's a whole other talk about more informal ways of practicing, but I really see that, especially if this is something that's newer to your life, I think it really is, at least I've seen in the women I've worked with and, and things that it really is helpful to have at least some small amount of time in your day where you're formally dedicating to this. And what that happens to be happens is that this becomes an anchor for you. Like, oh yes, I'm going to do this thing. Oh yes. I remember why I'm doing this thing. And it anchors you to what's important for you. You know, I want to be present for what's important in my life, for my children, for my life. So I'm less screamy and yelly, you know, like, so I think taking time. So I invite you to think about that where in your life and all these creative ways, maybe that we've offered to you, can you fit it in? Is there a lunch break? Is there another habit you can tie it to so that it can be something that's just very small and very doable? And in fact, say you do this and you try to meditate. Another thing is frequency, right? We talked about consistency. I, my favorite frequency recommendation is daily, but with a caveat give yourself a lazy day every week. Give yourself a day where you're not setting the alarm. You're not, and it's nice to do that. And sometimes I encourage my clients to do that and they don't do that because they feel so good when they meditate. But it is nice to just give yourself some lazy time. And maybe you try for five days a week. You know, maybe you have a weekday thing too, but try that consistency, but make it really, really small, really small and doable. And when you do it, say you do it for two weeks, 
give yourself a reward. Reward yourself. It's not easy. It's hard to meditate sometimes. I mean, it's, it can be very hard. You're facing all of your, your crazy monkey mind and your thoughts and all of these things. So give yourself something, even if it's like, I'm going to go buy myself some fresh flowers, which I never do. You know, like reward yourself with something that feels good and supports you. I love that. And I've, I've had multiple meditation teachers say to me, you know, better that you meditate for five minutes or 10 minutes a day every day than an hour once a week. Like, yeah. you know, what we do every day matters more than what we do occasionally. And I think the last thing I want to throw out there that was such a gift to me when I was reminded of this is that there really is no such thing as a bad meditation session. And I mm -hmm. will come away, I will talk to people, my clients, and they say, oh, I'm terrible at this. My mind is wandering so much. I keep having these crazy thoughts. Like I should be calm and still. And what I will say is, no, no, no. Like that's not the point here. The point is to notice whatever those thoughts are and then come back to your breathing or come back to whatever you're paying attention to in this meditation session. And if you have to do that 60 times in 10 minutes, that's fine. That's your practice. And maybe one day you have this like super grounded, amazing, calm meditation session and the next day you don't. And that's okay. And what I would really encourage listeners to pay attention to is not necessarily how they feel during the meditation session, because you may feel calm and grounded, or you may feel bored, you know, irritated, twitchy, anxious. That's okay. Like all those feelings are fine. But pay attention to how you're feeling in the rest of your life, right? Mm -hmm. So if you're sitting on a regular basis, meditating, walking, whatever it is, but if you're doing your meditation on a regular basis, then start to notice how you're feeling in the rest of your life and how, how you're behaving and how maybe reactive or not you are, or how patient or not you are. And so don't worry about having a perfect meditation session. That's, that's not a goal. You can't, you can't get meditation wrong. The only way I would say maybe you could get it wrong is if you're beating yourself up about it. And, and the minute you notice yourself beating yourself up, that's a chance to practice mindfulness, which means noticing it and being compassionate to yourself and cutting yourself some slack. So just stick with it, even, even when it's hard, because as I keep reminding my kids, we can do hard things. We can. Hey, yay. I love that. Yes. Yeah. I'm going to write yeah. that on my chalkboard. We can do hard things. I like that. And yes, yeah. and we need to show our kids, like we can walk that talk, right? If we're trying to tell our kids to like do something that's hard for them, you do something that's a little challenging for you. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> yes. and, and, and you can share your success with your kids, you yeah. know? Guys, I meditated five days this week and it wasn't easy and I did it anyway. So I'm going to, that's why we have like these beautiful flowers or that's why we're going out to dinner tonight or whatever it is. Yes. Yes. I love it. I love it. Yeah. yeah. Yay. Well, as always, thank you so much, Carla, for being on the Mindful Mama podcast. I love hanging out and chatting with you. Well, thank you for having me. And I'm just so grateful for your voice and presence that you give to all of us because you make parenting easier and more pleasant for a lot of people. And I appreciate it. Oh, thank you. Right back at you, Mama. Yay. <laughs> hope you enjoyed this episode with Carla and my conversation. That woman cracks me up, but I loved her stories about the great meditation teacher who was off the wagon for two weeks. And, you know, it doesn't have to be that hard, but the benefits can be so life-changing. It is really, really great. So I hope this episode has really inspired you to make your own practice and you can find some resources. I have some resources at mindfulmamamentor.com slash free resources. I think it is. You just go on my site. It says free. So that's mindfulmamamentor.com. So you can check out. There's some resources for you there. And I hope that you will leave a rating like those wonderful new iTunes ratings we got from Mama Christian and T Park 44. So thank you guys again for those. And I hope you'll come and see me in person, live and in person at the Spring Mindful Mama Retreat. You can find out more about at mindfulmamamentor.com slash spring retreats on April 14th. I hope you'll join me. We can hang out in person. And that's it, I think. Thank you so much for listening. I really appreciate this time that 
we get to hang out together. It feels like a great connection, I think. So I very much from my heart appreciate you listening and sharing and writing and all the wonderful things that have come from this connection and this medium that we get to connect together. It's very cool. So if you have questions, of course, you can email me at hunter at mindfulmamamentor.com. And coming up in the next episode, we are going to have a very cool conversation with Cheryl Jones. Uh, we're going to talk about when your cosmic egg is cracked. And Cheryl Jones writes about a mindful journey. So I think that you will like that a lot. And that's it. I hope you have a really beautiful week. I wish you relaxation, enjoy some laughter, a little rest, a little less striving this week. Yeah, should we go for that together? I like that plan. Okay. All right. Have a good week. Namaste. Are you frustrated with parenting? Do you want to practice conscious, compassionate parenting, but you don't know how? It's not easy and there's no roadmap for this. Until now. I'm Hunter Clark Fields, creator of the Mindful Parenting Course, and I know how frustrating it is because I've been there. I struggled as a young mom, and when I found myself yelling and triggered by my child, I knew there had to be a better way. And there is. Mindful parenting is different from other parenting trainings. They don't tell you that all that good advice is as good as useless when our internal stress response is triggered. Mindful Parenting teaches you research-based tools and practices to reduce your stress response so that you can respond rather than react. And it teaches you exactly what to say that, so that you can create willing cooperation from your child. You can learn more and enroll at mindfulparentingcourse.com. And you can join us for a free live training where you'll learn why your kids don't listen to you, what punishment really teaches, the parenting truth that every pediatrician gets wrong, and the hidden myth that undermines your parenting. Sign up now at mindfulparentingcourse.com slash free training. That's mindfulparentingcourse.com slash free training. I'll see you there.